Okay, can you confirm you're seeing my big data screen, please? I can, yep. Okay, great. My name is Mike Reed. I'll be your host today. Today's webinar is on big data in your career, where I will share some insights of my own um, rather than just present a bunch of information you could find yourself. I took the time to reach out to the big data community, um, central to Jacksonville as much as possible. I'd like to um, involve them and, and thank them for, for their efforts. Um, with that said, let's get this started. Fasten your seat belts. We're off and running. Big data. What exactly is it? Where does it come from? Has it always been there? 100 billion to 400 billion, the number of stars in the Milky Way, also the number of gigabytes of data that is collected every month and, like the stars, is impossible to count. Unlike the stars, the amount of data collected doubles every day. 4.4 million, the number of global IT jobs that will be created to support big data between 2012 and 2016. 1.9 million of those IT jobs will be in, in the United States. For every one big data IT job, there will be three non-IT jobs. Again, my name is Mike Reed. Thank you for attending. Um, today's presentation is not a detailed dive into let's implement uh, Hadoop uh, uh, deployment. It's, it's high enough level that you can actually get your arms around big data. There is a lot of territory. It is not a single platform. It's made up of a million little pieces and, and hundreds of companies that are contributing uh, to, the, uh, to the experience. So again, rather than uh, repeat a bunch of statistics, I reached out to the big data community, to people and businesses that are already invested and seeking people in different disciplines. So to that, uh, to that end, I talked to a technical expert, an impl implementation expert, data scientist, solutions provider, educator, and a chief technology officer. So we'll talk about the big data landscape today. Um, we'll talk about the big data phenomenon, what it is, what it isn't, where it came from, where it's going, and where you might fit into the puzzle. We'll talk about Apache Hadoop. Um, more uh, high-level functional overview of the components, a uh, very brief description of what they are, but again, talking more from a functional standpoint. We'll run through the Microsoft uh, big data offerings. Um, this is not a Microsoft-centric or specific uh, presentation, but it's I have to mention them, so they are a big player in the space, and they do have some pretty cool stuff, actually. So. And we'll talk about your career present insights from the professionals I talk to and what their opinions are on what it takes to work in the big data area. We'll discuss the relevance of uh, current skills and skill development paths, and we'll talk a little bit about training opportunities. And finally, we'll wrap up with industry insights. These are uh, personal insights from the contributors and, of course, my own musings on big data at the very end. First up is Adam Jorgensen, um, his perspective, big data expert. He's president, Pragmatic Works Consulting. He's also a director for PATH. He's a Microsoft SQL Server MP, MVP and SSAS maestro. 13 years extensive experience with SQL Server, SharePoint analytics. His focus is on parallel data warehousing, tier one OLAP, private public cloud, and big data. He actually worked with Microsoft, or has worked with the, the Beta, HD Insight, and Hortonworks prototypes since they were actually released to Beta. Um, has close contact with a lot of people at Microsoft, um, so he's very much in the know there. He's currently in charge of bringing the brain trust at Pragmatic Works to bear on the big data space, where we are ramping up to provide workshops, boot camps, um, to help our customers get started in this, uh, in this area. Second, reached out to Denny Lee. He's a senior director at Concur. Um, I know him from Microsoft. I did some, uh, spent some time there myself and had some contact with him. Um, his perspective, industry technical expert. Um, 
Denny is a, uh, a pretty interesting guy. You should check out his site sometime, dennygeely.com. Um, he is a, well, in his words, uh, delivering solutions to solve complex data problems, and that's very much an understatement. Um, he also was involved even before beta. He was involved in the project Isotope, which is the precursor to HD Insight for Windows for Azure. Um, he also, to his credit, uh, worked on Yahoo's 24 terabyte SQL Server Analysis Services Cube specialties, and there are many of them. BI Analysis Services, Power Pivot, uh, Hadoop, everything, whether it's Windows, Azure, um, or the Apache Distro, data warehousing, data mining, analytics, um, healthcare informatics. Um, again, you know, check out his site. Interesting guy. I reached out to Matt Berseth, Chief Scientist and Co-Founder at NLP Logics here in Jacksonville. Um, his perspective is data scientist. He's, his background is software engineer. Um, prior to co-founding you NLP know, Logics, he worked primarily in designing and building large enterprise scale systems in marketing, logistics, and healthcare informatics industries. Matt has a software engineering degree, a Master of Software Engineering and a Bachelor of Computer Science. He's also an alumni of Stanford's inaugural machine learning and probabilistic graphical model courses. That's a serious mouthful. Reached out to Robert Marsh, also at NLP Logics. He's their chief technology officer. Um, has 15 years in healthcare IT data analytics and system development. Um, he was software develop, uh, director of software development in his prior role. He has a degree in management information systems. And they hooked me up with one of their uh, uh, partners, um, a man by the name of LaRue Cillier, uh, founder of Laminin Solutions in the UK. His perspective is solutions provider. He's managing director and company founder. Um, his master's in information management and a long arm's length list of uh, accounting certifications. And one thing led to another, and I wound up talking to Sharif Al-Fayoumi, PhD at University of North Florida. He's the Associate Dean of College of Computing, Engineering, and Construction. Um, since 2000, he's focused on data mining. Um, he has a strong background in high-performance computing and artificial intelligence. And then myself, you know, why am I qualified to talk about this? Um, Myself, I have a long history of designing innovative solutions to difficult business problems. During the last 14 years, I focused primarily on database development and architecture, more recently BI and analytics. I'm currently employed by Pragmatic Works as a consultant. Previously, I was director of insight and analytics at a Jacksonville healthcare claim processor. Prior to that, I held operations data and information delivery centric roles in Microsoft's online services division specifically Ad Center in the Behavioral Targeting Group, which is the primary research unit for mining social behaviors at Microsoft that supports the Bing search, uh, Bing decision search engine and Bing ads. Um, hey, Michael? Yes? I hate to interrupt you, but the only contributor we see on the screen is Adam. Are the other ones supposed to be popping up oh, as well? Geez, they are. Thank you. Okay. I'm sorry. No problem. Anyway, thanks. Okay. Technology problem here. So. There, or finally to me. Um, in a prior life, um, I was co-owner of a multi-million dollar manufacturing business, which with my partner, we grew from the startup. Um, that's where I gained much of my business knowledge. We were a little unique in that we were able to survive two recessions when other businesses were closing up. So, um, and I attribute that to use of our data. Um, I've always been interested in business, and I have always been interested in where the numbers can be used um, and how they can be used to help businesses out. Um, let's see. Big data, the industry, let's go in and talk about what it is. I have a few statistics here. Um, 1941, the phrase information explosion was coined. 1961, law of exponential increase. Um, this is actually related to scientific documents um, and how one spawns another, but it seems to be uh, appropriate to almost anything anymore. 1967, we're talking about uh, automatic data compression. They're already realizing that storage was an issue, and 
all storage must be, all data must be uh, compressed to consume as little storage as possible. 1980, data expands to fill the space available talk. Um, it's an adaptation of something called Parkinson's Law, um, which states work expands to fill at all time available for its completion. But that was 30 years ago. Um, 1986, you know, almost 30 years ago, can users really absorb data at today's rate? Um, again, you know, that was a long time ago and the data around was, you know, not that big, relatively speaking. 1996, Evolution of Storage Systems paper states that digital storage has become more cost effective than paper. That's when things really started to move um, and started to jam up the, uh, that's when storage actually started to become cheaper and cheaper. 2000, how much information study states the world produced about 1.5 exabytes of unique information? Point to note, um, myself, I bought a 400 meg hard drive around that time and it was roughly a dollar per meg. So that's, uh, those exabytes were not cheap. 2007, Expanding, expanding Digital Universe report stated the world has created 161 exabytes of data, also predicting 988 by 2010, doubling every 18 months. 2010, same study, the actual number was 1,227 exabytes, it was 20% off. 2012, same study, 2837 exabytes, and this is where you can do the math and figure out the uh, statistic 90% of the world's information has been created in the last two years. I was a little shocked by that. Personally, I went, no way, but apparently that was, the numbers add up. So today, business can leverage the entire web as a data source, and that's huge. Uh, Jim Gallo, National Director of Business Analytics for ICC, 2013 is the year big data will find its way out of the data center and back rooms. Um, and into the chief marketing offices, chief sales officer, the C-level execs. Um, this is kind of big and gives you some indication as to where, they're, where the industry's at, where the movement's at at this point, which is you know, kind of a warning sign. The type of data that's growing very quickly is the hardest to understand. Um, we're looking at more and more connected devices and video, natural speech, um, data, um, you know, what do you do with that? That's, it's not easy to look at, not easy to find patterns in. So let's talk about big data, what it is. Uh, 1999, Richard Hamming, Hamming, mathematician, pioneer computer science, scientist pointed out purpose of computing is insight, not numbers. I personally very much agree with this. Numbers are more or less useless unless you uh, can do something with them. Um, in preparation for this uh, webinar, I've read hundreds of articles and I've seen a zillion definitions for big data. Um, there really appears to be lack of a single universally accepted statement. And that, to me, says things are up in the air and it's, it's a really good time to get on board and, and step up to the plate if you have any interest in the area. Um, there aren't a lot of constraints to what big data is or can not do, which makes it even more difficult to uh, try to nail it down to something very, you know, a 12 word sentence. Um, as an example, I went and reached out again to these industry experts and asked them what their, started by asking them what their definition was. So we'll go with Denny Lee first. Um, he quoted the V's, which is probably the most widely used or widely repeated uh, definition. It starts with volume. Data can't be processed due to volume, typically goes outside boundaries of a single server that uh, could process it, which implies uh, the need for distribution. Velocity, ability to, in Denny's words, check that data right into Hadoop without the usual relational delays. Um, variety, Uber data types. Um, again, Denise Akai would know every six months to year we're reevaluating how we optimize and store data. So the file types change radically. This will continue to change at a rapid pace for the foreseeable future. And the fourth V, which is not always talked about, variability. 
Um, his words, there's a confluence of multiple variables that come into play when trying to process and understand the data. Um, however, data is being loaded so quickly that every variable that is needed is not being called out. This infers that we load data up, we don't necessarily know what's in there, and we may not even know what to ask until we ask some other questions. So today we ask some questions, we find some answers, and tomorrow we will probably adjust those answers, or those questions, looking for different answers. From Adam, a uh, very forward-looking perspective, um, it's not simply unstructured data that's said an awful lot. Um, it's an ecosystem of tools that allows a more agile approach to doing certain types of analysis. It's an opportunity, oops, sorry, got ahead of myself. It's an opportunity to move customers beyond the relational world and let them do things and solve problems with tools and platforms that align more closely to the questions they're trying to ask. And I think that actually is a very good description and, and certainly some of the major qualities of, uh, of big data. Okay, Matt's turn. Data science, scientist's perspective, very much po focused on customers and value to business. So his words, not specific to the Vs, not specific to just volumes of streaming social data. It's a big data type of value opportunities that can be applied to smaller data sets. So maybe we have a fifth V. Um, techniques for predicting, predictive modeling are the same regardless of the size of the data set. And noted that big data um, frequently involves relating seemingly unrelated data. So uh, Leroux, interesting guy, um, he believes the concept is driven mostly from the massive amount of data, uh, particularly in large organizations. Um, he talks about uh, uh, the information has so many dimensions and angles and is growing in volume such that it's quite difficult to get your arms around it using standard reporting. He also talks about the richness of data in an organization and around them that they can plug into and get better decisions and guidance out of that, something that many are not doing today. Robert Marsh, CTO over at NLP Logics, um, not necessarily very large uh, data. It's the data you care about, what you choose to measure, and what you use to build insights into your business. So my musing. Um, data needs to tell us a story. Um, tell us something we don't, didn't already know. Help us to understand what to ask and point us in a direction with some degree of confidence. You need to give us a direction to go. Um, the story that we get from the data could be more precise, even more diverse, as long as it's the truth that has great value. Confirming what we already know is comforting, but usually not worth the money spent. Confirming what we intuitively believe um, or feel to be true is great. Showing us something new, something we didn't know, good or bad, is really in the range of magnificent. So what we're really after is actionable insights. Um, if I were to roll up everybody's definitions, this is how I would put it. Um, big data is an ecosystem of tools, irrespective of size, type, irrespective of data sources, um, which can be used to extract useful information in and around the business, overcoming the four Vs. So let's talk about what data, big data is not. A um, few misconceptions. Um, first off, it is absolutely not new. Um, big data, certainly relative, but big data has been around for a long time. Big companies with big budgets have been dealing with it forever, um, of particular note and way back in history, kind of history. 50 years ago, I guess, um, is CERN, when they were, each of their uh, experiments, 150 million sen sensors take 40 million, or images 40 million times per second, resulting in 6 million billion data points in one second. Um, again, big companies, big IT budgets have been doing, doing big data for a long time. Um, as a rule, they're only ones that can afford it. Some small companies, um, of which I believe my enterprise um, in that prior life was one of employed big data derived strategies. We definitely used everything around us that we could find, um, not just our own numbers, but we looked at what was going on in our community. And, uh, that certainly helped us to 
avoid some of the things that forced many of our competitors actually out of business when, when the uh, margins started going away. So it's not a replacement for re relational data. Um, Adam's words, relational is not going anywhere. Um, most prevalent uh, deployment right now or implementation is non-structured fitting beside structured. They are, they are good for different things. They will probably never be totally good for everything. So the two sitting side by side works out pretty nicely. Um, we'll talk a little more about you know, some of the benefits of, uh, uh, of running the two platforms. Uh, Denny commented, in fact, new SQL systems and big data analytics systems like Impala and Drill are all about taking massively parallel processing and relational constructs and integrating them into big data systems. So he's referencing the, the beginnings of uh, parity, of uh, moving some of the, the functionality that exists in, in the relational systems and moving them into uh, the non-structured systems. And it will likely go the other way as well. Um, it's definitely not a replacement for the traditional relational model. It's highly likely they'll live side by side for a long time. And again, um, Hadoop, the non-structured, we'll talk about Hadoop specifically. It's a, it's a batch processing system. So it comes with you know, the delays that exist in batch processing, however small they can be. Relational, um, you're looking at near instantaneous results from high quality, well-defined, highly secure data warehouse data has been validated. It looks great from any angle you want to look at it, usually supposed to be. Um, that is not the case typically with, uh, with the non-structured systems where you load everything up. Um, the big data platforms, the, the non-structured platforms very frequently are almost always used for some sort of percentage, some sort of analysis, which is reduced to some, you know, 80% of something, you know, is, is close enough. The 80-20 rule applies very heavily there. So um, unless you're actually studying outliers, your algorithms should actually throw out the outliers that would skew results. And so the, the fact that you may have some, some unqualified data in there is, is really not an issue as long as you understand it. So big data, why is it exploding, exploding now? Um, it appeared without studying this very much that something had happened in the very recent past that's driving this uh, lightning paced adoption of the big data platforms. Um, just out of curiosity, I googled the words big data and returned uh, returned 2.33 billion results in, of course, you know, 0 or 0 0.027 seconds. So again, brought to you by big data. So today, we have machine-generated data. Um, humans, 30 years ago, couldn't do it nearly as fast. But now we have everybody connecting. Um, everybody has a device, and social media has certainly taken over the, um, at least what appears to be the popular front of big data. Um, again, I'll reiterate, 90% of the world's data has been created in the last two years, and that is largely because of uh, social media. There's also a lot of uh, uh, oil and gas exploration, social data. Um, we have sensor data. We have uh, uh, healthcare records, imaging, research data. Um, you name it: astronomy, meteorology, everything. You know, there's there are so many electronic devices that are generating data and, and pushing it someplace, and that's how we got where we are. Um, words from Denny: We do not know what data we have or what data is important and what is not. But to discern information from the noise, you have to save all of it and then expect it, inspect it to determine what's valuable. Adam commented the ability to store now and explore when you have a question that's worth asking is, is key to this, uh, uh, this explosion. So you can then take that subset of data and roll it up into a relational system for analysis. Um, obviously, you can do that within the uh, Hadoop structure if you're um, of the relational world, you might find it easier there and you might find it faster in some ways. Um, Robert commented, now hitting the point where small to mid-sized companies have been collecting data for enough years that now it's useful to them. Many companies weren't doing a good job until 10 or so years ago. Um, 
I would say that's absolutely true, and I would say that's why my competitors years ago um, went out of business. Revenue source. Um, data as a revenue source. It's growing and adding revenue-based offerings around data which didn't exist. Um, customers are finding more revenue opportunities in data than hard goods and services. That's an, an interesting shift. Um, years, years ago, you could buy demographic information. Now you can buy behaviors. That's, that's huge. Speed. Uh, Denny, ultimately it's about the need to store all that data and ability to query all of it in a distributed manner. So this, uh, uh, these clusters, this distributed processing, distributed storage, processing data where it lies um, is what makes this whole platform really work. Um, you don't have to move it around and, and load it up and massage it before you actually query it. It's, it's queried where it sits and it can be queried again across one cluster or in Yahoo's case, um, 100,000 clusters. Tools. Um, alignment of tools and platforms. Adam's comment, the ability to have more tools in your bags to do analysis more quickly is really important. So there are a lot of people that are, that are contributing to the big data uh, landscape. We'll cover a little bit of that, talk about it briefly. I'll show you a visualization that kind of should impress upon you how, just how crazy it really is. Um, tools and cheap hardware. Um, machines have gotten cheaper. I mean, this whole platform runs on commodity hardware or near commodity hardware. Uh, storage has fallen radically, radically, radically in the last few years. Open source software. Um, licensing costs are way, way down. So the, the uh, there's a number of uh, breakthroughs in machine, machine learning, neural network algorithms, a lot of scientific papers or research papers being published by the uh, universities and colleges. Um, put all that together and you have a low barrier to entry with a really high benefit. Um, additionally, socialization. So as well, uh, mentioned the uh, storage of socialization storage and mining techniques. Uh, Facebook, Google produce a ton of white papers. Um, socialization of results. You know, Amazon makes uh, you know, they're not shameful at all when they say 35% of their sales revenue comes from the recommendation engine that's, you know, powered by behavioral targeting. And all businesses want that same result, regardless of how big or small they are. So that's, that's driving people that are paying attention um, towards this platform. And, of course, demand. Um, necessity breeds in, uh, invention. You need to store and process volumes we've never had to deal with before. A lot of organizations don't have Twitter and, Twitter, Twitter and Facebook volumes, but they want to be able to ask the same kinds of questions and use the same patterns. Um, Adam spoke of an unfulfilled business wish list, uh, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Denny, the understand the need to understand more data, not less. And Robert, if they don't tap into their data, start using the money more wisely, their competition will and will outperform them. So. My observation, um, particularly from uh, Microsoft and the behavioral targeting group there, you know, targeting, blanket targeting is a waste, of, a waste of money and resources, not just in dollars, but also in, like in Microsoft's case, they have a policy of, of two unsolicited emails to all of their, uh, all the email addresses, everybody that signed up. So they, they, they can only send out two and they want to uh, monetize those as, as heavily as possible. And there it's all about conversion. So they want to send things that are relevant to people. They sell people in groups, uh, demographic groups, targeting groups, and they want to get as much for them, of course. And they're all looking at, you know, the more effective their tar their marketing is, their, their targeting, um, the more likely they are someone is to click and someone is likely to convert, to actually make a purchase or whatever the end goal is of the, uh, in most cases, the advertiser. So Adam's wish list. Um, all of these speak to, everybody's ideas are, speak to adoption and feature development and are the wish list items Adam spoke of represented, representing unfulfilled business needs. Low cost is, you know, certainly I think the very highest uh, uh, facilitator in this explosion. Stability, the platforms 
it's actually been around for quite a while, um, but it's there's it's been adopted pretty heavily. It's uh, <clears throat> there's a number of uh, add-ons, a lot of functionality that didn't exist a few years ago. It's really starting to stabilize and mature. Capacity, again, you know what you do with all this data. Um, there is no limit to uh, to what can be stored. Almost no limit. Nobody's hit it yet that I know of, as far as how far out you can scale a uh, uh, you know, at, at the HDFS, the file system under Hadoop. And there's demand, demand for analysis of non-traditional data types. Um, Clickstream and log files, you know, not so non-traditional, but actually pretty hard to work with. Images and video, for sure. XML is always kind of nasty. And our usual text documents. So, where is big data headed? In the emerging industry, Things look chaotic until the dust settles. This is where we'll talk about who all is involved in this in the big data industry. So this this visualization is a uh, it's actually using a data mirror uh, uh, tool. It is a all of the registered um, participants in the Apache Hadoop project and their connections to everybody else. So if you had any doubt that there are a lot of people involved and there's a lot going on, um, this should take care of that. So there's a lot of big players, um, large vendors like Microsoft, IBM, um, EMC, Dell that you see involved there, um, and there will continue to be a lot of players. It's unlikely that they'll force each other out. Um, Everybody certainly will try to claim their own space and, and uh, integrate with their own tools, existing tools, and use what they have. But um, some of them are moving pretty quickly into uh, uh, adopting new technologies, likely to be a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, business purchases in the in the process as this thing shakes out over the next few years. A lot of small players. Um, Everybody, even you know, companies like uh, NLP Logics, um, they're, they've carved out a little niche, you know, trying to serve uh, uh, data mining solutions to small and mid-sized businesses. They're not worried about the big guys. They're they're a little hard to sell, but there's a lot of companies that that need help and can't afford to buy you know their own data scientists and deploy their own solutions and so. There'll be new roles. Um, Adam uh, mentioned chief marketing officer. That one's fairly new. Um, it's very possible that, uh, uh, as Adam commented, that it's, it's very possible that the chief marketing marketing officer may hire a Java developer, uh, goes to Amazon, writes some big data code, uploads it to Elastic MapReduce, put their data in S3, and never even have to call IT. You know, when they find the value then they can go to the enterprise data warehouse and then call IT to load everything up. We have new data sources. Um, Matt pointed out the NSA database that everybody's hearing so much about every, you know, every day, today even, so reading the BBC news. Every retail wants that or similar data. They want to know everything about everybody so they can understand what things are doing and, and all the uh, factors that influence their behavior. Um, we have a huge amount of uh, uh, data collected from connected devices. We'll have, uh, we'll see more as because of the stability and adoption of these platforms. We'll have, uh, you'll see more venture capital startups um, like uh, Sparks, Cloudera, Impala, Hortonworks, all are or were. We'll see new languages. Uh, Denny brought that up. You know, for uh, we have some for querying. Analytics like Julia, that's you know kind of brand new. Uh, we'll have again languages for querying the data as it sits in the file system, uh, and we'll have new functionality. Uh, Cloudera, Hortonworks, Denny's comment. Um, we'll go ahead and build very cool support clusters. We'll have improvement of real-time PubSub systems, which basically means you know, the ability to move stuff in and out of uh, of uh, the uh, file system and also to handle the transactions between the, the components.
components of the uh, Hadoop platform. And we'll be looking at uh, probably more functional parity with traditional related, relational database management systems. And of course, you know, the real jewel of the whole thing, in my opinion at least, this is where from a business perspective the rubber really hits the road and becomes useful, um, better analytics. So we have ecosystems like NoSQL, SQL, Cassandra, Sparks. Um, they'll continue to develop better analytics. We'll have new data visualization platforms like the data mirror uh, uh, visualization you're looking at. Um, then he's predicting a reign of statistics. It'll become more than just ags, counts, and trends. It'll be application of machine learning, data mining, graphing, etc. So we basically turn the machines, you know, make them a little introspective, and that's really what data mining and AI is about. Um, analytics to support a changing business landscape, heavy on social behavior mining, scientific research. Um, all this means better use of resources, and bottom line, better business. Big data, where is the value? I think I've kind of given that one away, but we'll talk about it. An estimated 40% of the $500 billion spent on advertising every year is wasted, the result of blanket marketing, less than optimally targeted marketing. A collection of data, this is my thought, a collection of data without Analysis is, from a business perspective, a waste of human and financial resources, which are typically in short supply. On the other hand, well-executed analysis can propel a business well ahead of competitors, driving up efficiencies and driving down costs. I thought this was pretty darn interesting. Comment by Adam. Um, we'll get to that in just a second. So, Adam's thoughts. Storage is cheap. Um, storage cost, software costs. Um, Hadoop is open source, there's no licensing, there's development costs are, are low, um, allows for fail fast um, development, proof of concept. You can make a pretty small investment in the uh, Hadoop uh, infrastructure of some sort, load data quickly. You can let an an analyst muck around with it for you know, a month or two, three, um, and find out whether there's something valuable there or not, or at least know where, you know, know whether you should continue to pursue it. Um, there's also the deferred investment in data structure IP, you know, not having to know everything about your data when you load it up before you load it, before you can even begin to look at it. So that's, uh, that's pretty huge. Um, flexibility. Adam, cloud supports low investment. Elasticity for performance. Um, we have speed. Um, Adam can do more productive work in the same time it would take to validate it in a relational system. Um, Adam's comment and, and you know, from his observations, you can get rid of 75% of your ETL. Um, Real-time BI. Now this is, again, I thought pretty interesting. Um, Hadoop gives you better functionality for real-time BI than a current platform. That is literally because as fast as you can stream data into HDFS directory, it becomes available in my reports. So if they are small or if you are scaled across enough machines, you can get results in virtually no time at all. You can get you know, results in minutes. It's no cubes, no ATL, it's just a file copy. Push it in and query it. There's also the uh, um, augmentation of uh, uh, with U.S. Census Bureau, United Nations data, Facebook, Twitter, you know, all the big players with their cloud offerings have their own data stores as well. So tomorrow, marketing will ask a different question, um, which is what we talked about a little while back. Uh, it's a powerful tool for miner, mining. So many ways to evaluate today. There will be new ways tomorrow um, as the algorithms and uh, uh, tools improve the mining and the results and accuracy of the remind of the tools will uh, or the results will improve as well the challenges um, what are the issues with you know what are the dangers around you know difficulties and dangers around you know a big data solution um, my statement would be Poorly designed analysis provide a little more insight than can be obtained by a flip of the coin and at far less cost. And I actually saw that um, 
had in the uh, behavioral targeting group. It was pretty interesting how easy it is to get off track and not really understand what you're uh, uh, what you're dealing with. So implied sophistication of businesses. I posed that question to a number of the uh, uh, participants and their responses were usually around uh, asking the right question. So Robert is exactly that, defining the correct problem or question to ask. Um, his statement, it's harder than people think to ask the right question and understand whether the models are producing the results you think they are. Part of the goal is to properly measure the results and understand whether or not they have the impact you think they do. Um, Adam's comment, lots of businesses want to run a big data solution, don't know what it is, don't know how to use it. In many cases, it's poorly implemented, uh, no different than a typical relational system, many relational systems. Um, question to Robert for me, how many big data efforts are driven by inspiration versus dur duress? Um, I was curious to know, you know whether people or you know, businesses are signing up voluntarily or not. Um, he said about half of them are actually doing it voluntarily and are approaching it aggressively. Um, the other half are lost somewhere in between. Many of them are introduced to big data or talked into big data by uh, corporate friends. Uh, another question came up, is age and maturity of the business, uh, business owners and management a factor in the adoption and implementation? Robert says yes. Uh, a lot of people aren't aware of what is possible, like incorporating social media into their marketing. Um, we also have uh, Matt, who gave us a, uh, a response um, to, have you ever had a case where you've not been able to help someone? And he gave us a qualified yes or technically no. Um, the only time they have not actually been able to help somebody was a speculative project. There, what they call low, the signal to noise ratio was low. The signal which determined the output was buried and barely distinguish, distinguishable from everything else. So, not uh, uh, not bad, I'd say. Are we in for a new round of information overload? Can we continue to capture and store at this pace? Um, from Leroux, he commented, we're still at the beginning stages of getting significant data out of this magnitude of data or significant value out of this magnitude of data, um, purely because the analytic tools and understanding of what we want and what is value, valuable to us is so poor. Um, he also indicated there's a huge, huge potential for future technologies in terms of digesting and delivering information to people. The more information there is, it becomes so overwhelming that the average worker ignores more things than he ignored in the past, so people actually become poorer even if there's more information around because they can't digest it. He also made a comment about analytics going wrong. Um, his uh, example was there's a danger in this whole thing whereby 15 years ago I would go to a doctor, a specialist, he'd formulate a learned answer which he studied for a long time to get. Now we go on the internet make a decision instantly. It's completely unfounded but that's how decisions are made with a minimum of information and the data is not necessarily validated. So. Uh, you know, there's definitely some gotchas in here. So let's talk about our predictions um, for this uh, this phenomenon. Is this is this a bubble? Um, Danny's words. Um, this is this is more like a an Amazon.com bubble. Perhaps too many people invested into it in the beginning, but it didn't matter because anyone who invested was lifted anyway. I believe, myself, I believe that will be true of your career if you choose to invest in it soon. Um, Denny talked about the uh, Gardner Tech Adoption Curve, which we'll go to in the next slide. Um, Matt, I don't think there will be a burst. Um, there will be potholes and they're easy to step in, but the promise is so high that we'll keep moving forward and take that risk. So Gardner Technology Adoption Curve. Um, they talk about trigger technologies. They talk about um, all these developing uh, uh, platforms and, and you know, all these concepts. You know, more concepts that haven't been implemented, implemented, and the expectations uh, rising to what they're calling the peak of inflated expectations, which are 
expectations without a dose of reality attached to it. Um, then we hit the trough of disillusionment, disillusionment when we actually start implementing, we start looking at the, the costs and the technical issues. Um, in uh, Gartner's uh, opinion, we are at, that's actually where we're at. Um, following that up, we actually start digging out, things start to stabilize. We, um, I call it slope of enlightenment where we learn a few things, we solve some problems, and then we hit this uh, plateau of productivity. And that's where everything, that's, that's where a lot of people will get on board, but um, for a lot of people it's probably going to be too late. So question, who will be the winners and who will be the losers? This is, typically, this is uh, in reference to consumers. Um, you have the usual variety, big companies, a lot of companies spending a lot of money and, and wasting it. Um, we have companies that are choosing not to uh, invest at all because it you know, it doesn't, it's not beneficial, they don't feel like they're, uh, uh, they don't, might only touch it once or twice in a, in a long period of time. Um, companies that will ignore it, um, those are the people that are likely to be the first to uh, take a dive. Uh, winners are obviously the ones who get it right, but it's, that's not an easy, it's not an easy place to get to. Um, requires a great deal of uh, uh, caution and validation. So referencing the adoption curve, uh, my, my thought, the ones that rode the initial climb and fall have certainly paid for it, but they came out with experience that latecomers don't have or they will actually have to pay dearly for. Um, statistic looked up, 35% of U.S. companies uh, have implemented a NoSQL or Hadoop solution split almost evenly between the two. So adoption rate's pretty high in the U.S. It's lower uh, worldwide, 8% is what they're saying. So let's talk about the Hadoop uh, ecosystem. This is going to be reasonably quick, so here we go. Evolution of Hadoop, 2002 it began development. Um, 2003, uh, Google could, I'm sorry, Hadoop could, uh, it wasn't technically, it wasn't Hadoop at that point, could crawl and index hundreds of millions of pages. Also in 2003, the Google file system paper released, which is what Doug Cutting and Mike Caffarella um, used to build out the HDFS, uh, to design the HDFS uh, uh, platform. Uh, 2004, Google released the MapReduce paper. Um, that is the key to the distributed processing, um, mapping down and, and reducing back um, these pieces of queries. 2006, Cutting went to Yahoo and Hadoop was actually born, 5 to 20 nodes. 2008, Yahoo, it was pretty much complete, had 42,000 nodes, hundreds of petabytes of data. 2008, uh, I'm sorry, this should be 2008, Cloudera form. 2011, Horton Works spin off from Yahoo, and here comes the, uh, the, the late comers. So we've had a couple of them here recently. You've seen a lot of ads on uh, pretty much everything you've talked that has anything to do with, uh, or anything you've touched that has anything to do with an IT web page. So the ecosystem. Um, HDFS, this is the file system. Um, it's uh, uh, comprised of a number of uh, clusters, usually in threes, or they're redundant anyway. So you have uh, you know, inherent fault tolerance. You also have distributed uh, querying. Each of the nodes uh, processes, its, processes its own piece of data. Um, you have MapReduce, which is the, uh, the part of the platform that will take a query and break it out, down into smaller pieces. We'll distribute it and pass it off to each of the uh, HDFS clusters. Each of the clusters processes the data where it sits and then it returns just the result, and that's the reduced part. Um, we have PIG, which is a platform for analyzing, analyzing large data sets, and it's optimized for uh, parallelization. So, um, it assists MapReduce in breaking the queries down, uh, or presenting them so they can be broken down, so they can be distributed. Hive, uh, SQL variant, looks like a uh, data warehouse system for Hadoop, uh, facilitates easy data summarization, ad hoc queries, um, provides a mechanism, provides structure onto this data using a SQL-like language, HiveQL. 
HBase. Uh, it's modeled after Google Big, Big Table. It's a uh, non-relational database that allows for low latency, quick lookups in Hadoop. We have Yarn, which uh, deals with the resource management uh, of the platform, the compute resources and the clusters and scheduling. We have Flume um, in the data loading uh, category, which is uh, for populating Hadoop with data. We have Scoop, which is a connectivity tool for moving data uh, from non-Hadoop data stores. And we have HCatalog, which is a centralized metadata management sharing service. We have Uzi, which is uh, scheduling and workflow management. We have Google's version of it, and we have Yahoo's version of it. We have Ambari, which manages the, uh, the nodes themselves um, as far as deploying, administering, and monitoring the clusters. And we get to analytics and data mining. We have Mahu, which is machine learning, it's a data mining library. Um, we have R Hadoop, which is a, uh, a, a framework for the R language, which allows you to submit an R-based algorithm uh, via MapReduce to the clusters. And we have Pegasus, and which is our advanced analytics platform. So that's that's certainly not everybody, but that's kind of what the pieces look like. And this, you know, the idea here is it should indicate there's a there are a lot of uh, uh, there are a lot of parts, and the parts don't necessarily all have a you know, well a straight line connection. You know, we have pieces that can reach into HDFS. We have other file systems that can sit under under HDFS. Um, so it's it's not like well to get to Map reduce. you have to go through each catalog. You do not. Strengths. Um, parallelization, obviously that's the, that's the big deal. Um, queries are distributed. Um, you can scale these to any size. Um, again, Yahoo with their you know, 100,000 nodes now, something like that. Um, again, many supported file systems. Uh, it does not have to be HDFS. It can be anything. I'm sorry, it does have to be HDFS, but it can be any file system underneath it. Um, and you have licensing and hardware costs, which is you know, pretty darn cheap, all in all, relative to what you're getting. Weaknesses, um, we talked about data quality. Data is as good as what, you, as what you put into it, or the output's as good as the data you put into it. Since you're not validating, you typically don't validate data on the way in, then you certainly um, you know, stand the chance of getting unexpected results, but if you're only looking at percentage, percentages, statistical analytics, you probably don't care. Uh, Microsoft HD Insight, um, not a whole lot to talk about here other than they took the, you know, basic uh, Hadoop ecosystem and added some things to it. You know, Technically, Polybase is not part of Hadoop. It is, however, their connector to Hadoop from the parallel data warehouse. Um, it also allows you to create a uh, parallel, uh, Polybase allows you to create a SQL-like join to a, a variety of sources, you including Excel and files and whatever else. Um, PDW is their, their uh, giant uh, SQL server on steroids, um, actually, in, um, integrating a number of SQL Server machines and, and their storage to act as one unit. Um, they obviously have uh, integrated with their standard platform, SQL Server, Analysis Services, etc. Eventive driven processing, BI, their whole uh, BI stack, and that's, in my opinion, really Microsoft's big contribution to the whole deal. They've uh, implemented, uh, uh, integrated with Active Directory for security, which is probably a uh, a good thing. Um, on the Azure deployment, uh, it's hooked up with their storage vault, um, with their marketplace, and they've uh, integrated with System Center for management of the whole thing. So, of course, their languages, JavaScript, etc., um, provided connectors for all of that. So let's. Um, Strengths, non-structured plus structured. Um, 
you know, with HD Insight and PDW. You have uh, some great visualization software, some pretty good, it's easy to use, and, and really, again, my, um, I think one of their strongest contributions to data, uh, big data. Let's talk a little bit about your career. A um, couple of statistics, by 2015, 4.4 million IT jobs. Uh, we talked about that. What that's really saying is there's a lot of opportunity at this particular moment. Um, according to a big data jobs index published by Crunch Data, there were 600,000 jobs in the U.S. market um, in the big data space as of May this year. So who is it? Um, Sorry, um, today big data positions are not well defined but beyond the legacy job descriptions that support them. So it's like a square pig in a round hole. And what we're, I'm hearing from these uh, participants is that you really need um, to think about not focusing on you know, products but looking more you know, horizontal. You know, if you like IT, um, you should think about uh, um, not only Microsoft based IT, but you should look at the uh, Hadoop core system. Um, you should think about you know, expanding, you know, learning a little bit about data, learning a little bit about analytics, and and looking to change what you what you uh, what you do and, and expanding your horizons a little bit, you know, laterally, not so much vertically. So job hunting. Um, this piece is a little more conversational. Uh, we're going to get short on time here, so I'm going to try to run through this pretty quick. Um, what do you look for in a job applicant? What what skills um, are you looking for? Um, for data scientists, uh, they're looking for statistician, machine learning, both. Um, usually can't find them. Um, looking, the big part is looking for someone that has a capacity, and I think this applies across the board, to make a slight career shift from one area into another, you know, more into a more of a blended role. Um, so they're looking for people that are excited about big data. Um, they're looking for intuitive problem solvers. There are there's a lot of intuition that goes into some of the uh, some of the analytics, and they need people that are problem solvers. As an employer, um, what are the risks of hiring you know an advanced analyst or data scientist? Well, if you need one, you're probably in trouble because you're probably not going to find one. Um, this is where companies like NLP Logic. Uh, wants to come in, you know, they fill that gap, uh, allow you to not have to put that person on your staff and provide the services for you, uh, and then leverage their uh, investment across a number of companies. Um, In-house, um, there's an issue with uh, developing something they really don't need, you know, going down a road that uh, wasn't well thought out, wasn't well validated, and so you wind up with this uh, giant something that really is providing nothing in return. Vacuum a data scientist, advice from employers, uh, hire a developer and teach them statistics or the other way around. Um, again, talking about intuitive, uh, intuitive skills, bottom line is they need people that can think and people that are interested and people that are excited. There's such a gap right now in, uh, in uh, the workforce and qu people qualified or people with any experience whatsoever uh, that it's, it's pretty much wide open. Um, again, data, uh, need open-minded data uh, professionals, not platform partisans and Adam's words. Um, good advice here, make sure you're the go-to person in your company. Um, know the cloud, know the, how to get apps up there. Um, be the champion within your company and, and you know, that provides you the opportunity to stay involved. In your own, in your own business, and uh, maybe your business can grow with you as uh, you wind up with the hero badge in the end. Um, let's talk about job opportunities again. Six hundred thousand jobs in the U.S. Um, Eight percent of companies worldwide. So I read that as saying, okay, U.S. is obviously well ahead. There are some ends that are already occupied in the in the job market pretty heavily. Um, if you believe the statistic that everybody will have some form of big data analytics in their uh, inherent in their business by in the next seven years, that means there's another uh, you know the remainder of the hundred um, percent to go. So doors open, but 
not forever. Um, Hadoop SQL and no spend forecast, enormous money, enormous money, 3.48 billion um, over the next couple of years. So companies will be spending the money, they're gonna need somebody to run it. Big data training. Um, what do I need to learn to go do big data? Um, start with, uh, you know, you need, I personally think, a little bit of business understanding it. You kind of need to understand how your data is going to be used, um, what you're going to do with it, where it's going to go. Um, you probably should have uh, some statistics, just a little bit, at least understand what they are so you kind of understand what algorithms do and, and what drives them. That also influences uh, what your data looks like and how you know what you might do with it. Um, nobody says that a roadblock to or exposure to stats is, is mandatory, but um, you can dabble with libraries, learn as you go, um, and this is from the data scientists. So, but skills are necessary. Um, as your cloud understanding, uh, whether it's Azure or anybody's, you, you know, understanding the cloud, how to get data in and out, Hive pick HCS file system, the basic pieces. Um, uh, some of the querying tools, visualization tools. Um, you need to understand MapReduce and if you happen to be running on Windows, basic Windows admin skills. So, wow, we are really close to out of time. Um, interesting question, if you didn't look, up, if I didn't have a degree on my resume, would you look at it? Um, absolutely. So I'm gonna run ahead here. So job recruiters, um, none, very few. So let's wrap this up. I got a minute left. Last words um, from Adam. The question most people are asking: What am I going to do with big data? Um, data customers are excited about being able to have the opportunity to rethink their end-to-end -end architectures, something they couldn't do years ago. Um, we also stated people that are being left behind are being left behind by their choice. Pretty, uh, pretty wise words, I do believe. Danny, a um, smart person will put his career on big data. Join discussions, get involved. Um, not necessarily kill yourself. Um, start with your strength, expand your skills. Matt, um, internet is the great equalizer as far as information. Uh, get educated, resources are there if you're interested. And he's referencing um, the uh, Websites like uh, uh, Coursera, edX, um, where there are a number of training courses out there that are free. Some of them are certificate programs. So to wrap this up, um, personally, I'm really excited about it. I'm anxious to be more involved. Um, I truly feel like I'm watching the birth of the universe. Uh, I suppose I should play my slide for you over here, shouldn't I? I was running ahead so fast. So. I feel like I'm, uh, it's early enough in adoption, uh, evolution of adoption that you really can, you do have time to define your own space um, as anything you like. You know, within your own company, if it's not already set on a path, you have the opportunity to help drive that. So be open-minded and learn. If you don't have an analytics background, uh, think about training up and, and at least, you know, as Adam said, go buy a, you know, a two-week book and, and read and understand it. Um, for me, and relative to the bubble, if you get in soon, you'll come out like a rock star. You'll be, just by the flow, you're going to move to the top very quickly. Um, a couple of years from now, as, uh, as these colleges you know, ramp up their, their degree programs and people start coming out with their degrees, it's going to be a lot tougher to, uh, to land a, a job. If you start, you know, they will come out with no experience, but a degree, you will come out with experience um, and some training. So um, as a rule, in a, in a uh, heavily uh, employee, you know, job hunter market, that's a good place to be. That's a strong place to be. So I definitely recommend partnerships with your peers, community, and professional associations, um, like Jack's Big Data Meetup, who helped drive a lot of this, um, certainly the past visual chapters. And the last words, today you might be one of hundreds of thousands in a few years, and will by all the estimates be one of millions. So I've gone over. Um, if you have questions, then um, please email them to me. I'll show you my email address here in a minute. So I want to real quick thank uh, Adam, Danny, Matt, Robert, Leroux, and Sharif. Um, 
for their contributions. Also, Mike Russo at Robert Half for his direction, Robbie Robertson at Ignite, and Ignite, and Ted Willich over at NLP Logic that um, put me on the road. So that's it. There's me, Mike Reed, uh, my personal at iheartbigdata.com. Um, you can also email me here at pragmaticworks.com. Um, I have Adams, Denny's, NLP Logics, everybody's uh, either the website or email address up. So thank you all for attending. Um, I hope you got something out of this. If you have something you'd like to know about in the future, um, I would be happy to share more as I start diving into the pieces and uh, try to make some sense out of out of it, uh, figure out where I want to be in the industry as well. So let me know. Again, thanks you for coming.